Don Chorus I wonder which philosophers were nibbled by bedbugs, which humes and locks slapped and scratched at fleas, finally sitting up and hunting by candlelight, fingernail sawing the foes of the rational, which Hegel's drifted off only to be roused by pesky theses and antitheses. The fridge rests, my muscles sigh. I wish poems would surge into the quiet, like nature filling a void. I had inspiration insomnia once, the first time my viral load was declared undetectable. I kept pen and paper beside my pillow and wrote supine in the dark. At first it was like reaching for a lover and finding him always turned on. Did Pascal's pensée importune him, I wonder? Did he make regular nocturnal trips to the water closet, applying his famous wager to his bladder's demands? Come to think, he probably slept with a chamber pot. Into this lull, which won't last long, the shushing of not-too-distant traffic rushes. Also a neighbor pulling into his snowy driveway, and my laptop blowing on its overheated microchips. And that constant high pitch my dad can't hear any more, the sound of hearing itself. Early stirring yields you in your knit cap. Sometimes your glasses have slid down your nose, and a book like a roof or a bird frozen in flight straddles your chest. These roles are never reversed, but that's all right. You watch over me so dearly during the day you deserve a rest. I pause here to hum the chorus of someone to watch over me. I suggest you do the same. Or if you don't know it, check it out on YouTube. Nancy Wilson's rendition has a quality of cut glass. Or if you want to hear the verse and are in the mood for voluptuous, try Sarah Vaughan. Which lovers of wisdom would love the sight of you breathing through your mouth? You broke your nose when you were a kid. What about my parents occupying our bedroom this three-day weekend? Which one shuffles past the sofa at three this morning? Aging steps, man's or woman's? Hard to tell. Aging scent, male or female? Equally stale. What will he or she feel witnessing this disjointedness of limbs begging to be reassembled, this risky sanctuary that beckoned to so many suitors in my youth? Cradle pose, a baby's coiled toes and ineffectual fists. It's forty-seven years since the cord was either incinerated or dumped or sold with the placenta for as much as thirty thousand bucks. Judas wants to kiss him. At night in their camp he lies apart from the group, already wrapped in a singular death. He gazes on the sleeping face. He tries to tame his breath as he fondles his robe, praying for that kiss, alone, silent and unknown, just as he has taught him. At last, in dreams tight as his robes, he suffers dust, tug and thrust, poor and crippled, poor and blessed. The possessed, the blind, the lame, moan the name he sighs in his schemes. There must be a moment apart, a path crooked or straight. There must be a price on those lips. November 1st. India inked canopies. Stripped at fall's leisure. Cut Maxfield Parish silhouettes. Iron obelisks in place of wooden utility poles. The Christianization of Europe. Here at Regal Point Apartments, only you and I and the Hindu family raise our blinds. We, determined not to be ashamed, and they, acculturated to a happy shamelessness. The air is humid. I am humid. My sweat is my part in the humidity. No need to invent ways to participate. That vacant lot used to be mowed. Today it's choked with Queen Anne's lace, rocking from side to side as though shifting its weight from one foot to the other. Here is chirpy as Edie Gourmet blaming it on the bossa nova. August 27th. The sun is jerked up sudden as a blind. A blind goes up steady as the sun. That's the look I dread. Eyes clean as a just polished bath spout. My skin begins to understand Emily Dickinson. It's as untouched by lechery as hers was by her doctor's untrusted fingertips. I am bound by habits, as she was bound by expensive lace. Nor can I escape into infinity. She used it up. Spring, and all it hides, all the deadness it deadens, 
its opacity stretching between us and our important sins. The river bend is struck migraine white. In a parked car, you make your body as still as a Victorian bride, schooled in frigidity. Three years after the disappearing fairies, I ask myself, what sort were they? Ferrying whom? I want to believe they resembled the Staten Island fairy. I like its sweet potato color. Suppose they were ferrying dream workers, strangers cast in our midnight movies. We tell ourselves they were glimpsed in revolving doors, spun and spit out the opposite direction of ours. We don't like to think we create them. If we do, the boats must be akin to mythological conveyances, not as substantial as the Staten Island, though they sport the same earthy orange. It's a terrifying picture. Uncredited actors with their sack lunches, heading out for a night's work, for which they are poorly paid, chugging toward the island of some stranger's subconscious, never getting there. All those dream shows must close or limp on with a depleted cast. March 12th. Court ruling by court ruling, the nation is ripening. When Grandma comes back, it's like the day she led my Asian students up the Broadway of our all-white Hoosier Burg. Only this time it's our wedding procession, and all the neighbors who peeped from behind their curtains at the ties, Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans, stand on their porches and cheer. November 4th, Crow's first verse high in the dark, Train's answering chorus, Dopplering past, even more stark. Wriggling free from a tripless numbing sheet, Acutely I feel I'll never be dark, Never sing like a night thing, Never race down a track, Slicing wind faster than any creature on wing, Warning townsfolk of my imminent attack. These early risings mean the sun is a slug of bed, And we are the happy, not quite right in the head, Captains of intellectual industry. I remove the lampshade. The energy-saving bulb is a turban of white heat in whose cold, angelic light I breakfast. You loiter in the doorway, in shorts and the ball cap you wear as religiously as a Sikh wears his head wrap. You know the Japanese tea ceremony, I say. Sure, you answer, with a mouthful of guava. Well, this is the instant coffee and toast on the floor, right? I met the devil and his concubine in the lounge at the Amtrak station. We were taking the same train in opposite directions. An atypically clear loudspeaker voice informed us this paradox would cause considerable delay. Pooling our loose change, we bought sodas and Milky Ways and settled onto benches, facing the unparadoxical tracks. With no hesitation, the devil proposed a game of strip theological poker, using our tickets as cards. On each he wrote a single proposition which we had to defend or else shed an article of faith. Lilith shuffled the tickets, the devil cut them, and I dealt us one each. Lilith glanced at hers and folded, old Nick called, I read. God is perfect love and forgiveness. At this the couple flamed up in infernal laughter. The devil read, God is a liar. He will never love or forgive me or any who lie with me. They laughed and sprang into a victory dance. Hearing longing in Lilith's laughter, I cut in, took her in my arms, and whispered maliciously in her ear, He will always love you. Nothing you do can dim his forgiveness. Suddenly my arms were empty. The devil dropped his trident and sank to the floor. November 12th. I don't want to bore you with my complaints. If I could bore you to tears or death or distraction, that would be another matter. As it is, I know the only boredom I can wield against you is the transparent sort through which you stare at the television or YouTube. All morning I reproduce the gesture, the offering of the crook of my elbow to the phlebotomist. All morning I wonder why this graceful tick haunts me. Am I remembering statues of the Virgin with her arms outstretched? Imagining she abandons character, pushes up her blue sleeves, exposes flesh that tempted the fleshless. I picture a compliant Christ rendering up his palms. I want to feel again my twenty-year-old naivete when a Swiss border guard made me roll up my sleeves, and I didn't know why. 
Now, Cher Queens, Betty Davis Queens, Judy Queens, Babs Queens, Madonna Queens, Joan Crawford Queens, am I the world's only Catherine Hepburn Queen? Mary Tyrone's morphine fog moves over Kenosha this morning. Philosophers' ghosts drift like lovers who've forgotten how to quarrel, like New Age disciples disappointed by a solar eclipse, renouncing the sun in a hissy fit. Some fear living by the water, some dry up living away from it. Heraclitus insists that fire is noble and water depraved, and our form of life requires both. The fog is wonderfully creepy, like the rhyme of the ancient mariner. It spreads the glass dust that filled Spinoza's lungs. It's as dumb as the kids that bullied Nietzsche. I made that up. He seems like someone who was bullied. It's as thick as the sand that cherishes the imprint of our asses. Thirsty, we pass its bottled silence back and forth. I would give up a lot, maybe even you, if I could get my first nightmare back. May 22nd. Let's look under the bed. Maybe it's there amid lost socks, underwear, garlands of condoms, the box containing tax return, testaments to my vow of poverty, my parents' living will and power of attorney, quietly waiting, untouched, avoided, like the thought of my parents' passing. An address book filled with obsolete addresses. I should write to see who sleeps now in my lover's and companion's rooms. A page from a desk calendar with the day we met and the day of our second date circled. Can I find the poem I wrote about that? The four slippers we picked up at Walmart on the way to the train station. You didn't want your feet to touch the hotel carpet. I wish my carpet was bright and could not fade. If I were God, the pigeon stepping off the ledge would turn into a hawk, which would turn into a heron, which would turn into a wren. All of these changes mid-flight, and the birds would live forever and never require mortality to make their moments worth living. They wouldn't know from one soar to the next the shape of their beaks, the span of their stride, the color of their feathers, their ability or inability to speak. I'll do something about this carpet, maybe a pastiche of accent runners. Our dread of looking foolish cripples us, whereas passions compelled by nothing more or less than natural law rise before dawn, stand straight on nest, roof, wire, limb, lawn, each an unabashed soloist. Every year for his birthday I renew the subscription to National Geographic. The stack's as tall as he is. The day we met is circled on the only extant page of a Japanese calendar one of my students gave me. In the upper left hand, Kakejiku, starling seeks starling in a thicket of white and violet flowers. Three lines of poetry twine like vines around poles. I'm alone today. He's with his family, agnostics to my existence. I read about the marriage ceremony of a tribe in the Sahara Desert, the wedding feast that goes on for a week, the nuptial tent the bride's friends enlarge a little more each night till it's big enough to welcome all celebrants. Sometimes you frighten me, though I know I have nothing to fear from you. Is it that I was born to be frightened, or that I was trained to it by a brother who gave me indifference and bewilderment when he should have given protection and comprehension? Is it your ingenious schemes for wriggling out of obligation and the way you boast about them? Is it the way you sit apart from your colleagues, brooding like Heraclitus in the school of Athens? I look at this Chinese robe, its brocade dragon weighing down a courtesan's chest and belly and thighs. Flaming pearls of wisdom swarm like gnats. Why do we think of wisdom as nacreous, hard accretions growing slowly in dark, safe innards? Hard and dead, what sort of wisdom is that? But if the pearls flame, that suggests dynamism, illumination, and perhaps most apt, self-consumption. O oh, cast not flaming pearls before swine, for gums and tummies will be scorched. Isaac kneels beside his father's bed. Since the day he was born, he has been the reward for a life of patient barrenness. Isaac kneels and watches the old man's face stir in sleep. He is the one who changed Abram's name, more like a groom than a son. Because of him, the servant girl and her child were sent to hunger in the desert. It was his fault and the fault of his mother's impatience. How old was the slave then? Not much older than he is now. Isaac kneels beside the bed, 
his father's manhood resting at last. How many dreams will it take before Abraham believes? In the first dream, it will just be negligence. A sharp tool will be left on the ground. In the second dream, it will be weakness. Quicksand will swallow the boy's ankles, calves, thighs. Abraham will fail to pull him out. In the third dream, rage will take command, turning the beloved son into a traitor. In the final dream, he'll simply be resigned to climb the hill, unaware that Isaac is whispering in his ear. This is a game I happily lost five years ago. A debt, thankfully, my parents can't bail me out of. You made the call all who love, fear, and live to make. Two men lifted me into the back of a truck that blinked and flashed like Las Vegas, slid me in like raw pizza into a stone oven. You called my parents in the middle of the night. You waited and watched the six hours it took them to arrive. Rehearsal for a vigil that, from your grace, was delayed for decades. Now in a new city, our own brand spanking new Jerusalem, I listen to tonight's sleep time medley, a YouTube playlist, whispering Jack Smith, Adele, the Welsh men's chorus, lowing soft as cattle, are hedonos. The computer draws these words in its light. When we touch each other's clothes and skin, two lives worth of manipulations carry us to the warmest port. Hands lifting mosquito nets, rolling play-doh, tucking foil around a dish, finger writing riddles in each other's palms, turning lights off and on, wiping each other's faces, easing lashes from each other's eyes, fumbling balls and choking guitars with capos, just me, darning sisters and growing palm sugar for elephants to nuzzle, just you. At 5 a.m., you announce your shower, as you always do. You needn't. I know the sounds of our home as a woodland creature knows the least rustling leaf. I study Wordsworth's peans to nature and Rex Roth's camping accounts. More botanical, more zoological, idealized nonetheless. My MacBook overheats my lap. Rex Roth flaunts his wife's nakedness. What would he think of the joy I find in your skin, the flat stomach, the crunches on the dining room floor, your legs and toes pointed like a diver's limbs as he penetrates the pool? I know when you're encasing your mind in impenetrable silk. You look like a child with a grudge to protect. I relax. You're safe.